everybody and welcome back. Artificial intelligence has been on everyone's lips at least since the launch of ChatGPT. Shares like those of Nvidia have exploded in recent weeks, not least due to AI. What is the impact of the topic in Asia? And which investments are suitable? We talk about this with Charles Worthington, Lead Portfolio Manager of the Sunlam APEC AI Fund at Sunlam Investments. Welcome, Charles. Thank you very much, Thomas. Nice to speak to you today. Charles, Sunlam has launched the Sunlam Asia Pacific Artificial Intelligence Fund's investment strategy. So why it is a great idea to invest in the AI market in the Asia Pacific region right now? I think the first thing that we would say is that uh, we have been investing in AI as an investment theme for over seven years, long before anybody had even thought about ChatGPT. When we first had a look at this universe, we split the universe down and there were probably about 200 stocks in the whole world that were dealing with and trying to invest in AI. But of that, only about 30 of those were in Asia. Since that time, AI and Asia Pacific in particular has exploded in terms of the opportunity set that is available for us to invest in. So we think that there is about 10 times the market in Asia Pacific now. And of that, Asia Pacific is by far a bigger majority or a bigger section of that universe than it used to be. Secondly, it is clear that um, West Coast America has a brilliance and a dominance in artificial intelligence right now. It has no God-given right to be the only place that you can invest in AI. And as you have seen over the last seven years, Asia mm. Pacific has become more and more prominent in terms of the opportunities that you can invest in in this region right now. So given the rapid growth of the um, artificial intelligence markets, how do you identify and assess promising AI companies or technologies in Asia to include in the fund's portfolio? Well, so uh, seven years ago, when we set up this process, we jointly developed with a data scientist an AI tool in order for us to be enabled to uh, um, interrogate AI companies all around the world. And using this tool, we can investigate any company anywhere in the world, in any region, any sector, and in any language to discover what investments and what uh, tools they're using in the AI universe. Having done that, we can then investigate how they're implying that, how they benefit from it, and therefore make a considered uh, decision as to what is the best way for us to uh, make some money in the Asia-Pac region. How do you achieve diversification within the AR market in the Asia-Pacific region? And how does your asset allocation work? I think diversification within any portfolio is of critical importance. And going back to what I mentioned earlier, the universe in Asia Pacific has grown exponentially over the last seven years. Secondly, we are very clear that this is not a technology fund, and it is also not a China fund that some people sometimes think about in the Asia Pacific region. It is very specifically aimed to be diverse across both geographies and across sectors. And our approach, we find companies that not just use the tools that make AI possible, but also take advantage of those tools. Mm -hmm. So it could be an insurance company or it could be a technology company. So that in itself creates diversification in terms of geography and in terms of sector diversification. And that for us is absolutely critical in offering to our clients a diverse and suitable portfolio response to their investment needs. When it comes to thematic investing, many investors might have the typical hype and bust cycle of new technologies in mind. So how do you balance the potential risks associated with investing in a new technology like AI? I think I'd actually uh, take issues with that question, Thomas. First of all, AI is not news. If you think about Turing, who came up with AI broadly, that's over mm -hmm. 75 years ago. So I think what is new is the engineering capacities through which we use AI, not the principles from which AI is based upon. Secondly, that's do understand that there is risk in terms of investing in any one thing. And I think you can break down the risk into three broad sectors. First of all, you could think about it in terms of valuation risk. 
And therefore, that could be quite sensitive just to interest rates, for example. And we are very careful to invest across different sectors and different geographies. Therefore, you're not beholden to just one investment style or perhaps growth investing. I think, secondly, there is perhaps geographical or regulatory risk that people might think about, perhaps particularly with regard to China. And again, it's not a China fund, and there are multiple different sectors and multiple different geographies through which we can find different opportunities within the region. So that gives us diversity, both in terms of investment style, it gives us diversity in terms of geography and in terms of sectors. And valuation is of critical importance to us. And we make sure that we don't overpay for growth. We can always find different areas of competition for capital within both the portfolio. And as global investors, we're very aware of what people are paying both in America, in Europe, and in the Asia Pacific region as a whole. Costs of capital have been rising due to the higher interest rates. So how does this influence the development speed of AI technology? That's a great question. I, I think there are two elements to think about interest rates, particularly at the moment. We have seen a very rapid rise in interest rates over a very short period of time. That is clearly true. And I think it's probably the fastest, steepest rise we've ever had in interest rates. But what is also true is that interest rates themselves are not that historically high in terms of history. We're at five, five and a half percent. Secondly, as to why Asia packets are interesting, you get the opportunity to play very different interest rate cycles by having exposure to this investment region. China, for example, has not been raising interest rates particularly high, especially when you're compared to, say, the US or to Europe. So you have different investment or interest rate cycles in this region. So you have a fast rise in interest rates, which has implications. You have different interest rate cycles in the region, but also we have huge internal competition for capital. We have a company such as Hitachi, which we bought on eight times earnings. This clearly has very different investment risks associated with it than you might think of some of the better known names in terms of if you think about NVIDIA, obviously not in Asia, but just in some of those high growth, high multiple companies. It's not a single investment strategy in terms of valuation. Could you share some investments made by your fund in the APEC region, the AI market? So what were the key factors contributing to your investment decisions? I'd like to give you three different examples to give the different and diverse approach we try and take to individual investments. Let's have a look at iFly Tech, one of China's leading local language model and speech to text companies. It's the leader in education and speech to text in China. It has its own large language model, and it's doing very high levels of growth and very innovative in terms of what it's doing in China. And it's a very typical AI style of company. Then we could perhaps go to Appia, which is an AI algorithm-based company focused on marketing. Uh, it's based in Japan, but deals with companies all around the world. This is a company which is growing its top line at 30 to 50 percent per annum, has that very high growth that people often associate with AI. And it is using the most advanced algorithms to get better returns and better client connectivity in marketing. And then finally, a company such as Itachi, a very traditional old-fashioned, you might say, Japanese company with investments in car parts and in uh, heavy machinery. Mm -hmm. But what it has done is used AI to revolutionize its portfolio. And it has totally changed the way it is doing business. It's developing a whole new range of digital platforms for it to serve its customers. And it has transformed the business. And this is a company which has gone from a trading on about eight times earnings to now 16 times earnings. So you've got very high growth in some elements and you've got very traditional, reasonable PE investments in other, in other businesses where AI is doing the transformation of the business rather than the actual investment in AI itself. So Asia Pacific encompasses diverse countries with varying regulatory environments. And when we think about AI, there's kind of a lot of discussion going on about ethics and, uh, and ethical um, developments. So how do you navigate these regulatory considerations when making investments in AI-related companies? And or does this play a role for you at all? It, clearly, we're in a world where we have to consider these aspects to investments. 
I think what we are very clear, it is not for us to impose our ethics on our clients and their investments. Secondly, we have a very diverse investment universe to think about. How China thinks about its ethical investments is very different. For example, we also have Australia and New Zealand, which have a much more Western Anglo Anglo Saxon style of approach to ethics. So we have multiple different countries with different styles to do that. We think about how our ESG ratings are within the fund. We are not an ESG fund. We are highly rated in terms of that. But it is down to the individual investments we have, and it is therefore an output of the fund rather than a, too much of an input in terms of the fund. So this was Charles Worthington, lead portfolio manager at Sunlam Investments. Charles, thank you very much for being with us today and sharing your insights into the development of the AI market. Thank you very much, Thomas. Nice speaking to you.